Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this professional learning opportunity. I'm Jessica Roberts, Business Relationship Manager with NCEA, and I will be facilitating this webinar today. Just a few housekeeping notes as people are joining. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A window. We will monitor the questions and try to answer them in the allotted time. At the end of the session, I will share a link to an online survey and how to receive um, a certificate of completion for this webinar. Today's webinar, Motivating Middle Schoolers, is brought to you by Archangel Education and Technology. Our speaker today is Stephanie Horgan, Professional Development Director for Archangel. Stephanie is an experienced educator serving more than 17 years as classroom teacher and school administrator. She specializes in learning um, in leading professional development sessions that focus on assimilating technology into cross-curricular units. She has spoken nationally on topics such as project-based learning, technology in the classroom, stream and use of digital tools, is a Google certified teacher and enjoys helping teachers learn best practices for integrating technology into the daily lessons in creative ways. Um, before I turn it over to Stephanie, we're going to go ahead and begin in prayer. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, teacher, um, God, God of love. Thank you for everyone, every teacher who notices the child's special gift. Thank you to teachers who are listeners and gentle guides. Thank you to teachers who expect much and love enough to demand more. Thank you for the special teacher in each and every each of one of one of us remembers god of mercy sustain teachers for every gift they have strengthen teachers who are assume the blame for so many problems beyond their control help exhausted teachers rest god of strength encourage teachers to care and inspire and nourish motivate teachers to keep on learning for the fun of it and make and to make learning enjoyable for children we pray these things in the name of our great teacher, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Wonderful. Great. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Stephanie. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I'm so excited that uh, you can join me. I'm I'm really thankful to NCEA for having me. Um, as Jessica said, my role is uh, Professional Development Director for Archangel Education and Technology. We are technology with soul. We are the human aspect behind uh, what can sometimes be called technology. And so we're we're here to partner with you and to help you with all of your technology needs. And today we're going to talk about motivating middle schoolers. So let's get into it. What a job we have. What a job we have. Um, encouraging and motivating middle school students um, can be extremely challenging. Uh, it is not an easy job. Um, it is also one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had working um, working with middle schoolers. I want to share that my first venture into working with middle schoolers was um, at the end of my very first year of teaching. I was teaching third grade. Um, I was a fresh 22 year old uh, learner, and um, I had a uh, I had a great first year, and I had a um, an administrator come to me and uh, she sat down. She said, how's your first year going, Steph? And I said, everything's going so great. I love being here. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, she said, do you want to, you know, are you excited to get more involved with the life of the school? And of course, fresh 22 year old me said, absolutely. I'm excited to get more involved in the life of the school. And um, what ended up happening was uh, she said, well, that's wonderful. We are looking for a cheerleading coach for our middle school team. And um, I said, absolutely. I would love to coach the cheerleading team. Uh, as a uh, fresh-faced 22-year-old teacher with zero experience of number one, working with middle schoolers, and number two, cheerleading. Uh, never cheered a day in my life, had no idea, but thought, how hard could this be? Um, well, when you take on 17 uh, young ladies um, who are six 
to eighth grade uh, as, as the cheerleading coach, you take on a whole lot of drama that you didn't quite expect. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you that it was one of the most rewarding experiences that I ever did and uh, went on to coach for another um, probably six to seven more years. Um, brought in some friends along the way to help me, um, but definitely loved, uh, loved the experience and learned a whole lot. By the end of it, uh, I was a certified cheerleading coach. <laughs> Um, who, who learned that, um, uh, maybe the squad needed to be no more than about 12 to 13, uh, students. And we ended up having a, a really fun time. And so that was my first, um, venture into dealing with middle schoolers. Um, so challenging yet rewarding. Um, this session, what we're going to talk about today is, um, providing educators with effective strategies um, and creative lesson plans that are going to inspire and captivate the minds of middle schoolers. Middle schoolers are a unique brand um, of, of young person. Um, they're not quite uh, old enough to be high schoolers and they're not quite young enough to be elementary schoolers where they're kind of babied and taken care of. Um, they're stuck in the middle. And so sometimes it's it's the most challenging time um, where hormones are starting and they're experiencing a lot and there's a lot of friendship challenges um, and kind of getting those students to um, embrace a positive learning environment and encourage active participation when really the last thing they wanna do is be in school um, can be really challenging. But I, I know that we're all up for the challenge of it. So this is one of my favorite quotes by an educator named Angela Bennett. Um, Teaching middle school is an adventure and not a job. If you've ever worked with uh, students between the ages of 11 to 14, uh, you will know that that is very much, uh, very much accurate. <laughs> they are um, they are an adventure. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, when we motivate middle schoolers, um, how do we want to go about that? Because it's it's easy to say things like um, you should want to have good grades. You should um, want to achieve your goals. You should live up to your potential. All of these things are true. And chances are most of the students know that and they've heard that but they're not motivated to, to be successful. They kind of want uh, to learn by osmosis. They kind of want to uh, have experiences just handed to them and good grades just magically appear. They don't really want to work for it. They're a little lazy sometimes. Um, so, so how are we going to keep them engaged? How are we going to um, motivate them to want to do well? Um, and when I say provide regular feedback, I don't necessarily mean grade your papers and turn them back in on time to the students. You want to set clear and achievable goals uh, for the students. You want the middle school students need to know what they're working towards, and then how can they achieve those goals? You want to break down larger goals into smaller and more manageable steps. So if you've got a 13-year-old sitting in front of you um, and you say, well, what's your goal to get good grades? First, you're probably going to get, I don't know, or get good grades, I guess. Well, what you need to break down is how are you going to achieve that? So what do we need to make sure you're doing? We need to make sure you're knowing where your homework is. Um, so let's talk about um, how we set those clear and achievable goals um, by providing that regular feedback, both positive feedback and constructive feedback. Students are going to know what they need to do in order to um, improve. Make learning relevant. We have to meet students where they are. Um, middle school students are more likely to be uh, engaged and excited about their learning if they see the relevance of what they're learning in their own life. Um, I actually 
I have a middle school son, a uh, middle school aged son. And he said to me the other day, when am I ever going to use this in my real life? And I said, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Well, he wants to be a chef. And so we started talking about how fractions are really important um, in the life of a chef. And so um, it was, I was able to make his, his pre-algebra class relevant to him by talking about why fractions are important to what he wants to do in his life. Um, and find ways to connect the curriculum to their uh, learning and to their experiences. If you can figure out how to do a project that brings in their cell phones, um, safely and respectfully, I encourage you to try it. Um, use those active learning strategies because they are going to, um, you know, middle school students, most of them naturally are pretty um, uh, uh, extroverted and they're drawn to their friends. They want to be around their friends more than they want to be around their parents or their teachers. So uh, make active learning uh, in the classroom happen. So Bring out those critical thinking questions that they have to discuss in a group. Um, figure out problem solving. Bring in real life simulations that they have to uh, work together to solve. And all of that together is going to create a positive um, classroom environment. And of course, this goes without saying, but you want to celebrate your student's success. Um, when a student succeeds, even a small um, a small achievement, celebrate their accomplishments, recognize them, um, and you know your students best. If a student really wants to be called out in the middle of class and, and recognized for their hard work, call them out in the middle of class. Some students would rather just shrink up in a ball rather than have the teacher draw attention to them. You know um, you can hand them a, a sticky note um, on the side at the beginning of class. It says, I noticed how hard you're working, great job. Um, even small accomplishments. I'll tell you, I had a student who really struggled, um, really struggled with organization. And uh, my last name is Horgan. And so students, um, and organization is my thing. And so students in my classroom uh, made me a poster uh, that said, get organized. And so that was the kind of theme of my classroom. And so I really encouraged my students to be organized. And um, I had a student who, um, he just looked like his little binder just exploded all the time. And he was a tiny little thing. Um, and, and every couple of weeks we would work together. We would reset his whole binder. We would go through his agenda. We would take out the extra stuff and file everything. And we would get all organized. And two days later, he looked like everything was falling out again. Um, and one day I noticed that it had been about two weeks before I had seen him um, with anything falling out of his binder. And so I wrote a little uh, sticky note for him and I put it on his desk and I said, I just noticed how hard you're trying um, in class. And you took the papers that I gave you and you opened your binder and you put them away the first time I gave them to you. Congratulations, amazing work. Um, and then I, I saw at um, the end of the year, he had taken my sticky note and stuck it in the back of his um, binder um, on the very back uh, where you have the clear view um, plastic piece so you can see through. He had stuck my note down in there um, and I didn't realize what took me two seconds to do meant the world to him. So uh, think about those things and celebrate your student successes, even if they are uh, non um grade related. So let's talk about some actual ideas. Um, how can we utilize um, the different things that we have in our classroom? So I want to talk about, I've talked about relatable content, things that, that show how they're applicable in real life. I've talked about students being digital natives. That's what we call students who are basically born with technology in their hands, right? They're, have you ever given a two-year-old an iPad? It's like they, they instinctively know what to do. Um, the technology that we have access to helps to cater to all these different learning styles and learning preferences. Um, and so embrace that, as I said, um, embrace the technology, even if you aren't as familiar with it, find somebody who is or talk to the students about that and, and let them guide you or let them help you figure it out. Um, I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk about gamification. Now, gamification, um, I want to preface this by saying um, 
I am not an advocate for gamifying your entire classroom. That that eventually the students are going to get tired of that. They're not going to um, want to have a, a whole bunch of um, of fun um, because what's going to become fun for two weeks after six weeks is not fun anymore. Um, and so we want to um, talk about how to gamify and also how to make sure that the gamification is strategic um, and not overused in the classroom. So you can turn tasks, common tasks into games and challenges. I know that um, I had many, many, many students um, come through my classroom over the years who are highly, highly competitive. Um, a lot of them are sports competitive. A lot of them were uh, game competitive. Like if I ever turned on Jeopardy uh, to play with the classroom, in the classroom, the kids would just, they would go crazy. They would pick strategically their teams to make sure that they would always win. They never won anything. I have to be clear about that. There was the prize was a, a great big high five from me, um, but it didn't matter. They wanted that, the, the pride of, of winning. And so um, I want to share with you some ideas that I have for gamification. Um, I also want to preface this by saying you are absolutely um, going to have a copy of um, this. I will provide this slideshow with Jess to Jessica, um, who will be able to provide it to you. Um, what, what you see here is all of these um, ideas are, are, this slideshow is going to be, um, it's going to force you to make a copy. Um, and so these ideas will be um, able to be loaded onto your drive directly once you hit make a copy. Um, and so it will be your, your idea. Um, what I've done down here is I have made sure to include all of my notes for you um, because I want to make sure that you know how, uh, how you can best um, utilize um, all of these ideas that I'm giving to you. So let's talk about badges and stickers. Um, badges and stickers uh, are really fun. Um, they can be a really important motivator for students. Um, I wanna share the story of um, a teaching partner that I had uh, several years ago who still remains um, my very best friend uh, to this date. And she came up with the idea of having a Google help desk um, back before that was really a thing. Um, and so uh, she taught the students how to fix the Chromebooks, how to troubleshoot, and they had to go through her elective course and they earned badges along the way. These were very simple badges um, and they she would create them in Google Drawings um, and she would customize them to every concept. And then she would distribute them once a student mastered a particular concept. So when they were able to replace a keyboard key that had fallen out of a Chromebook, um, they would get the, the key repair badge. And so um, it was a little, uh, just a digital sticker that they would put on the bottom of uh, their email signature and it showed what they were capable of doing. And so also the teachers got a copy of which students were capable of helping. So they would learn about the interactive panels um, and they would learn about, um, uh, you know, actual troubleshooting. So if, if um, a screen came up and wouldn't load, students would figure out how to, um, how to troubleshoot that and repair it. And, um, that it really, it was amazing to watch them. Um, and so they would be able to help their peers without actually uh, giving the, you know, having to take the computers away um, and have only the, the one teacher or IT repair person fix it. And so um, these badges and stickers were a sign for the students of pride. Uh, they were really, really proud to be able to have these stickers uh, and show them at the bottom of their email signatures to show what they were capable of. And so the students worked really hard to master these concepts so that they could earn the badges and the stickers. Um, these are a couple of examples of the different um, badges 
Um, and I took the concept um, and I applied it to my own classroom um, where I um, was, again, teaching, I believe I was teaching third grade at the time and we were doing multiplication. Once the students mastered their multiplication tables, they got a multiplication master sticker. Um, and this was just something, again, I created it in Google Drawings. It, it doesn't mean anything um, other than something that the student did that they can be really proud of and they can share. Um, it didn't cost me any money uh, it, to do. Um, and then every time the students would level up with their reading, I would give them a new reader status achieved with a different color background. Again, the colors were arbitrary. The colors didn't associate with a certain reading level. So students didn't compare themselves to anybody else. It was kind of like I would look at what colors they had and I would choose a new color to give them. Um, I have all of these uh, in a file. If you're interested, go ahead and send me a message. Um, my information, I'll share all of my information at the end. Um, and, and I'll be happy to share these um, with you. These are akin in this presentation that I'm going to give you, but I've got a whole file of them so I can I can share all of them. Um, but again, these were really, really fun for the students to kind of collect. Um, and it meant something to them and it meant something to to me, but it didn't cost me any money. It didn't I didn't have to worry about allergies or people eating or drinking things in my classroom or anything like that. Um, they would earn um, badges or stickers, um, depending on whatever I called them that year. Um, and then finally, when we talk about gamification, it doesn't always have to be a, a cahoot. Um, it can be different ways that we uh, create games in our classrooms. Um, and again, I'm going to exit out of here so that you can see this. Down here, I have listed how you can use each one of these things in your classroom. Um, and so this is really fun. You can do these, have the students do them together, or you can have them do it individually. Um, but even though the students are um, a little bit older, like I said, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, they love games. And so if you can gamify your classroom um, in certain ways, not all the time again, in certain ways, it is something that they will really embrace. So um, I have treasure hunts up here. You can create a treasure map or a series of clues related to um, lesson content. Students must follow the clues to find the hidden treasure or the pieces of information. Um, I have used this to teach um, history. I've also used it um, to help with problem solving skills. And I also used it when I was teaching um, geography. I would teach uh, geocaching. And um, geocaching, if you don't know what it is, literally is a, a small treasure hunt. Um, and it, it's really, really fun to learn about latitude and longitude coordinates. Um, and you follow this and you find little caches. Um, and caches are sometimes um, just small uh, little notebooks that are hidden in a tree trunk. Um, and you sign your name to it and you tell what date you found it and then you put it back for the next person. Um, sometimes you, you find a cache that you're supposed to take and you're supposed to leave something in return. Um, I have had um, students find um, little McDonald's, um, little stuffed animals or little McDonald's toys um, and there's, you're supposed to take it and it'll have a note with it, you know, take it and leave something and then they leave something in return. Um, and there's actual websites um, for geocaching. So if you're if you're interested in that, um, just Google search geocache. And that's how I taught latitude and longitude. Um, and it was really, really fun. I created a geocache on our campus um, and uh, actually logged it into a geocache website. Um, so the students had to go there with their Chromebook and follow the directions. Um, mystery investigations. You can present a classroom mystery and assign roles to students such as detectives or scientists. They must work together to solve the mystery by collecting evidence, analyzing the data, and making deductions. This approach can be used to teach critical thinking um, and also the scientific method concepts. Um, 
also really, really fun to do. I think we've all heard of escape rooms. And so those are really fun to do, but escape rooms don't have to necessarily be uh, with just math. Um, it can be with a lot of different uh, concepts and you can also use math, um, problem solving skills and teamwork to um, get out of a, a particular challenge. Um, you can also use, uh, you can also complete a literary quest. Um, this was really fun. <clears throat> I did a literary quest um, with uh, um, a Christmas carol when I was teaching, um, I was teaching literature and uh, I dressed up in um, the Charles Dickens era uh, clothing and I assigned roles to the students, um, gave them the option if they wanted to dress up. A lot of them did. Um, a lot of them didn't, but a lot of them did. Um, and they had to create uh, complete challenges or tasks that aligned with the plot of A Christmas Carol. Um, and that's also how I brought in a lot of Catholic social teaching themes um, into into my classroom as well, where we would examine the Catholic social teaching themes that were found in A Christmas Carol, and that promoted a, a, a deeper understanding and an analysis um, of the book. And always, it's it's always really fun to have any kind of language learning adventures if you teach a foreign language, um, you know, design a quest that requires students to use um, their target language to navigate through challenges, interact with characters, and achieve a language proficiency milestone. Another way that you can bring in um, a, a badge or a sticker uh, as well. I want to pause for a moment and just see if there's any questions um, because I want to make sure that I'm answering anything that that uh, has arisen. So are there any any questions? Well, if they are, if there are, feel free to go ahead and drop it um, in the either in the chat or you can even use the the Q and a um, as well. Um, we've talked about um, positive feedback, but I want to talk about the importance of choice. Um, again, like gamification, we cannot, cannot provide student choice with every single assignment that we do. It's just impossible. Um, and it's, it's not really an effective way to run your classroom either. But where you can provide student choice, that encourages students to feel like they have a little bit more power over their um, learning. And it increases um, your engagement <clears throat> and it empowers the students to feel like um, they have a say in what's going on. Because often I think students feel like they might not have a choice in, in, um, in their learning. And so often, you know, the curriculum guides what we teach them. However, um, they do have a choice in how they learn the material. And so um, the, the power of choice is, is very, very important, as well as learning from peers, learning from each other. Um, and it's important because you're gaining those 21st century skills. So when we talk about student choice, I want to talk about actual practical lesson ideas that you can put into practice in your classroom. Now, I'm going to share um, quite a few ideas here. I don't want you to get overwhelmed or feel um, anxious like I have to take all of these ideas and take them back to my classroom right now. Um, the way that I do professional development is the way that I liked to learn professional development when I was a teacher and an administrator. Um, I really like to have access to the materials, which is why I always provide every webinar I do, I provide all of the information um, <clears throat> to the attendees so that you can always go back and look at the information. Um, I have uh, put links in that you can see um, when we're talking about some of these things. I put links in so that you can actually have the materials with you. Um, and, and also I give you my, my 
contact information because I want you to contact me. If you have an idea and you're not sure how to execute something, I want you to reach out to me so that I can help you through that. I want to help you execute any idea that you have. Um, so I can be a sounding board. I can help you develop something, but just know that, that I'm here and I want to help you uh, learn. So let's talk about fact book pages. Um, this was, I'm going to take a drink here real quick. This was one of the most fun ideas I think I ever had. I was teaching social studies uh, at the time, and um, I wanted to have students do a Facebook page. Now, this was um, back several years ago um, when Facebook was still popular amongst the kids. Um, it's not so much anymore. I found uh, Instagram uh, is, is really... Uh, fun and TikTok is the way a lot of them go as well. Um, however, there are um, there are some ideas that kind of stuck, um, and this idea was one of them. Well, when I was doing a little bit of research, I found a blog um, from a teacher who said, "Be careful when you're having students do Facebook pages, um, because number one, you can't use the name of Facebook, um, and also number two." Students can't have Facebook pages until they are a minimum of 13 years of age and have the permission of their parents. Um, and so we didn't want to <clears throat> encourage students to go creating a Facebook page. So what I did was I created a fact book page and I talked about why I named it a fact book rather than a Facebook um, and told the, the students the importance of respecting those guidelines um, because they're put there for a reason. And so um, students can create a fact book page about a historical character. They can research and they can choose significant, significant events to include from that person's life or even cultural elements or technological advancements that came from that time period. Um, this project encouraged uh, research, critical thinking and creativity um, while connecting history to the present. As I said, I did this in social studies doesn't mean you have to do it in social studies. You can absolutely do it in literature. You can um, you can do it in science if you're talking about scientists. Um, you could even talk about it with like something like the periodic table. Um, you could even create a fact book page um, for religion if you're talking about uh, the sacraments. Um, you could create a fact book page about the, the, about the sacraments. Um, so I wanna show you an example of what this looks like. So this project, Again, it's going to encourage you to make a copy. This project was done by one of my sixth grade students. Um, this was far and away um, a top tier project. Um, I had a, I, I was um, showing this example one time and I had a, a teacher said, I would love to see like an average or a low performing student. And I said, I know I was just so blown away by this that, um, I just kept this one. Um, and I love, love, love um, the, the work that was done on this. Um, so this was done in Google Drawings. You can see um, it, it was done right here in Google Drawings. And so Google Drawings is just a blank slate. That's all it is. Um, and so the student changed uh, the background color and I gave them a rubric. They had to give the name of an explorer, um, the location, the dates that the person explored, what their technical job was. Um, and then they had to include three pictures. One of them had to be a map and one of them had to be a picture of the person. Um, they had to have five timeline dates. And then we used the opportunity to talk about email. Um, and I will explain to you why this is um, one of my favorite projects. Um, I'll never forget the student giving, uh, she was standing up at the front giving her presentation. And I could have had uh, the students um, do this as a group, but I actually chose to have them do this project individually. Um, and I, I loved the results. So this is Henry Hudson. Um, Henry Hudson was from England. He explored in 1607 and he also explored in 1611. Um, and um, uh, he explored the East Coast of uh, North America. He explored for the Dutch East India Company. And so um, I had the students 
<clears throat> explain or I taught the students about email, um, how email appears in your inbox, as well as subject line. That's what we focused on. And so um, I had them create um, a fake email inbox. And so they had to give me three. Um, the student went above and did four. Um, but um, two of the emails had to be authentic and one of them had to be a spam email. Um, and so Henry Hudson, if you're not aware, um, explored from um, around North Carolina, around the, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, <clears throat> all the way up to um, uh, New York. And he was looking for the Northwest Passage. Um, Spoiler alert, he did not find it. Um, it does not exist. But um, he sailed a ship called the Discovery. And um, what he did was he would he explored what became Hudson Bay up around the New York area, and he went back to England. Um, he reported back uh, to the Dutch East India Company that he didn't he didn't find anything. Um, and the Muscovy group um was another group that he sailed for. They sent him back and this time he went a little more north. And as he was coming down, he um, he went into, I'm sorry, I said Hudson Bay before. He went into the Hudson, what became the Hudson River area around New York. And then he went into Canada um, and explored what became um, the Hudson Bay up in close to the Arctic Circle. Um, well, unfortunately um, he, there was a who on his boat and he and his adult son, I always like to preface this with his adult son, um, were kicked off the boat and um, they were left in a little tiny uh, dinghy floating um, in the Arctic Circle and were never seen again. Um, and so the, the group took over the boat and sailed it back to England. And uh, um, Henry Hudson was heard, never heard from again. Um, and so this student took her um, information about that um, and created her email inbox from John Hudson. Uh, John Hudson was Henry Hudson's son. Suca his suitcase is packed and ready to go. So I explained to the students why it's important to have a subject line that explains what is in the body of the email. Um, the Muscovy group talked about the Northern Sea Route. Um, merchants are us. That was her fake um, spam. 50% off your purchase of compasses. And then finally, the, D the DEIC, which is the Dutch East India Company, upon your return. And I'll never forget this little girl turning around and staring at the group and just laughing hysterically because Henry Hudson did not return. Um, and she thought that was really a very funny email. And so we all kind of had a little bit of a chuckle at Henry Hudson's <laughs> expense, but um, it just showed me that she really took this uh, learning and this experience and applied it to what was really something fun for her. And so um, that's, that's really cool. Factbook pages um, are a great way to teach about um, email etiquette as well. Um, science in the kitchen. Um, so you can turn so, uh, cooking into a scientific exploration. Uh, sci uh, students can investigate the email reactions behind the cooking process, such as baking, fermentation, emulsification, um, and the hands-on approach engages the curiosity and highlights the science in everyday life. I use this opportunity to partner with the religion teacher who taught the middle school religion um, and to incorporate Catholic social teaching principles into those lessons as well. So what we did is we talked about um, Jesus, our, our whole theme was Jesus is the bread of life. And um, so we actually made bread. And we talked about the scientific process of making bread and we used starter and we created these loaves of bread and we talked about leavened versus unleavened. Then we got into talking about Catholic social teaching. We talked about um, needs versus wants. We talked about caring for um, creation and using our resources that were provided wisely and not wasting. We talked about um, dignity of the human person um, and that people are hungry and it's not a, a, a source of pride that somebody uh, needs help for food, but we are called to help those um, in need. And so what we did was we created 
um, a lot of loaves of bread because I did it with all of my classes and she did it with all of her classes. Um, and um, what we ended up doing was um, every group, I think it was three students, uh, ended up making a loaf of bread that we then donated to our church food pantry. Um, and those loaves of bread were then able to be uh, donated out. And it was um, talking about the religion. It was talking about our faith in action. It was talking about um, science and mathematics and measurements. And we we did this week long lesson and had um, some really amazing products at the end to share with our community. We did keep a couple of loaves uh, for ourselves for a little tasting um, and it was delicious. Um, then I wanted to mention um, literary character blogs. Um, reading a novel or a story, you can have students create blogs from the perspective of the characters. And this activity blends writing with creative interpretation, encouraging students to delve deeper into the character's motivations and emotions. Um, one of the things I did that was really, really fun one time was um, I had students um, choose a partner and they would take two characters and they blogged back and forth to one another. So one would write a post and one would write a response to the blog. And then the next time the person would write the post and the other person would respond to um, the blog. And they had a, uh, a rubric that went along with this. Um, you can do this with a lot of different books. Um, some of the more, um, um, interesting books that I did. Um, um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry uh, was a was a really interesting book to uh, to do that with. I also did it with a book called Pictures of Hollis Woods, um, and which is about a um, a young girl who is orphaned as a baby. Um, and it's about her journey uh, growing up in foster care. And um, and so that was uh, a really inspirational um, book that really got the students thinking. Um, and I tried to choose books that were that were really um, engaging to my students and relevant. Um, I tried. I often changed the books that that we read. I didn't read the same book um, from year to year to year. I also didn't have whole class novels. Um, I might have. Uh, chosen a theme, um, you know, and, and for example, this is just um, one theme, but you could have like a chocolate theme and um, you can have Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and you can have Fudge Mania and you can have Super Fudge and you can have um, uh, books with uh, with the, the chocolate theme um, for, you know, for your student groups and students can kind of read and get an idea of um, what kind of novel they want to uh, engage with um, and let them choose their novel. Um, sometimes I would assign novels um, depending on if we had certain skills, but a lot of times that's where I embrace the, the student choice. Um, and I had students who were never readers who became readers. They became really super um, excited about reading um, because they were engaged in what they were reading. Um, and I would, I would have it, um, you know, for some of my more athletic students, I might have um, uh, books that had athletic themes. Um, and for both boys and girls, um, I had some very athletic uh, students um, across the board. And so I would have students uh, that would, that would really embrace um, a more active, role I had um, in, in sports. I had students who um, were more excited about, um, you know, a, a realistic fiction um, of a student who had to face adversity. Um, think Hatchet, um, you know, as a young man named Brian uh, gets into a plane crash and has to survive in the Canadian wilderness by himself um, with only a hatchet. 
and um, how he does that. And so I had students who loved that. I had students who loved historical fiction. Um, and so I would get books that would engage them as well. So I tried to keep a variety of books available for my students. And I always, always, always encouraged them to bring books to me. And we shared together about what we were reading. So I would talk about what book I was reading um, and then I would have students talk about what books they were reading. And I didn't care if they were reading graphic novels. That's great. They were reading. Um, and so I would try to take their love of a graphic novel um, and, um, uh, and, and share that um, uh, with them as well. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of really great uh, things that the, that, present to us uh, in the literary field. And so really take that and try to create activities that that blend the writing skills with being really creative. And um, let's talk about environmental explorers. So I tried to give you um, examples across all of the core subjects, but I also want you to remember that um, you've got some really talented specials teachers in your classrooms, in your schools as well. And so don't uh, don't leave out the specials teachers. Remember to bring those that, those talented people into your classroom. Um, the music teacher can help you develop a song um, or figure out a beat. Um, um, that's I actually um, uh, taught about with uh, eighth graders one time slam poetry, and I had the um, the teacher the music teacher brought in uh, bongo drums, and we learned about slam poetry really fun, <laughs> really fun. Um, there were a lot of rules and a lot of parameters that went with it, but slam poetry was a great way to teach it. Um, so um, I want to bring in uh, and talk about environmental science and geography as well. And so having students take on the role of environmental explorers in their task with investigating a local environmental issue. They can present their findings through multimedia presentation and that suggest a solution to a real world problem. This is a true story. Um, I was not the teacher. I was only at the school when it was discovered, um, but I was teaching at a school in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, one of the middle school teachers at the time was doing something around um, this environmental explorers. And uh, they discovered that um, the school where I was had a protected um, wildlife species. Um, it was endangered. And it was, it had made its habitat, its home um, in the marshlands around uh, the center of our campus. And so kind of behind the school, um, there was like a little marshland and um, this, this uh, protected creature, I want to say it was a turtle or a frog, um, but this protected creature was discovered there by the students. And what happened was um, the students then um, explain what they found. Um, and that area became recognized on the local news and became a protected area. Um, and still to this day is a protected area and cannot be uh, built over or um, renovated in any way. It is protected marshland and um, is home to uh, this particular animal. And that was because of the students um, learning about just their direct environmental area of um, the school where they were. And so uh, the teacher was on the local news and there was such um, an amazing response um, to what was found. And so um, what I have here for you to wrap up our time together is um, I have a, uh, a list of project ideas and resources um, that you are free to take and use and click on. Um, I have writing prompts here for, um, for teachers. Um, this is a great way to start a blog in your classroom, um, but there are tons and tons of technology writing prompts here. And one of my favorite ones is just this really, oh, goodness gracious, one of this really simple one, and it just says, what is technology? Define technology right here. It's amazing what the students come up with. They come up with some really unbelievable things. You can take this and use this 
um, in your classroom. As I said, there's lots and lots of writing prompts. It's a great uh, story starter. It's a great way to um, have students think through um, and develop their writing. Um, I also like some of the other ones down here. Um, choose a technological advancement that has had a significant impact on, so on society. Discuss its positive and negative effects and provide examples to support your analysis. One of the writings um, that I had with that, um, I thought students were going to do like the Xbox or the cell phone. And I have a lot of students who did that. I had a student who put a coffee machine um, and I was blown away by that. I was absolutely blown away like that. Um, and um, I, oh, so thank you so much. Um, I had a question about how do we get the links that you're talking about? I'm gonna share this presentation. Um, and um, before we go, I'll share it in the chat. All of these are linked in the presentation and you can just click on them. Um, they're all yours. You can have all of them, um, but um, yeah. So he wrote about the, the coffee machine. And he, he's right. It's a life changing um, uh, technological advancement. And so he wrote about the positives and the negatives of it. So really fun, uh, really amazing things. Um, I also have um, here I have hyperdocs um, and hyperdocs are just um, I, I gave you a unit plan template for a hyperdoc. But all a hyperdoc is is a unit template. It's a plan where you just insert all of your links into one document and you share that one document with the students. And so um, if you have videos for them, if you have worksheets for them, anything you have for them, you can share. Um, in this template and just share this document with the students. That way they have all of your information from a, uh, a unit all in one place. That kind of goes to help with the, um, the organization that I was mentioning before. Um, and again, um, the same thing with a digital interactive notebook. I gave you directions on how to put together a digital interactive notebook. A lot of us know what an interactive notebook is. It's the, the scissors and the glue and the cutting of the papers and the folding and the putting into composition notebooks. Um, I tried that for one unit and um, made it exactly halfway through that unit before I realized that's not going to be a best practice for me. Um, so uh, I worked to develop a digital interactive notebook. And so I'm not going to go through and read all these slides to you, but I just want to show you um, what I have given you access to. If you click here where it says digital interactive notebook, it gives you all of these templates today. Um, you can have access to all of these graphic organizers uh, to help and share with your students. Um, also, if you follow me on um, Instagram, my, my handle is um, archangel underscore professional DEV. Um, and you can just search up um, archangel professional development. Uh, you'll see I actually touch on a lot of those um, uh, graphic organizers today. But this is yours. All of these resources that I have gone over today our, um, are yours to take. Um, and here is my uh, email. Please send me questions that you have. Um, I want to help you motivate your middle school students. All of these are really, really fun ideas. Um, and if you need help thinking through them or figuring out how you can apply them in your classroom, just send me an email. I'm quick to respond and I would love to help uh, get you started with uh, motivating your middle school students. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You know, it's near and dear to my heart, seeing as I taught eighth grade with you too. So yes. <laughs> it's always, it's Our, always isn't fun it, It's an adventure, you. not a job, right? <laughs> it's always it an absolutely adventure. is. <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, for those attendees, I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat the, um, the link for our survey at the end of today's webinar. Um, if you complete that, you will get a certificate of completion. Um, and then once Stephanie shares the um, 
links to all of her wonderful resources. We'll go ahead and get that shared out in an email as well. Um, yeah, I'll go in ahead and drop, drop that in the into chat. the chat right now um, so that everybody can have it. Um, again, all of these links are live and they are shareable. So please, um, you know, make a copy. And then I'll also, Jessica, share it with you so that you can send it out one more time as well. Perfect. And then um, also thank you to Archangel for having, for letting you join us today, but also yes. for everything that they do um, to support Catholic education and NCEA. Wonderful. I thank hope you everybody so much. has, yep. I hope, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your week. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Bye.